1900 or 1836 times the mass of the electron and slightly less heavy than the neutron. My point is the gravitational force, not just here, everywhere has to be what it is for the universe and life to exist. That's the argument, so answer that one. Well, Dan backed up and tried to answer. He goes, well, maybe, and this is a really big maybe, there are lots of other universes. And in fact, there are some cosmologists who say, well, maybe there are an infinite number of universes. And if there are an infinite number of universes, then our universe, however improbable, would in fact, at some point in the great cosmic rolling of the dice, at some point come up. This is what I would call, you may say in some version, the OJ cosmological argument. The DNA evidence points to me, all the other evidence points to me, but that's only in this universe. Maybe there are many other universes in which you, individual jurors, have, you, have killed your wives under new DNA evidence and under new laws. So why would you prosecute me in this provincial universe just because I did what I did in this local planet? Now look, I'm not saying that this is even untrue. I don't even mean to be making fun of it. What I'm really saying is it takes a lot of faith to believe it. Because what is the evidence for these other universes? Dan in his book actually cites this man, Lee Smolin, and his astronomical work. I just want to read you a line or two from Smolin. He says, what I'm, pre what I'm presenting in this book is frank speculation, if you will, a fantasy. And then, later in the book, I must warn the reader that the ideas I've been describing, there is every chance they will not succeed. He admits in the book very easily, he is essentially engaging, he doesn't like the idea of God. He says that the, the fine-tuning of the universe seems to point to a supernatural creator, but we can't possibly go there because we're scientists and we have to look for a natural explanation. So he goes, this is the best stuff I can come up with. Now, okay, fair enough, but how about some humility on the other side? How about admitting that there is a lot about our universe that does seem to suggest that just as a car requires a car maker, and just as a, uh, a painting requires a painter, the laws of nature do require some ultimate explanation. And that's all I'm saying. It opens up the possibility of a divine explanation. Thank you. Okay, well, let's, let's, uh, okay, okay, here we go. Um, the laws of nature require explanation. Well, at any one point, we explain the laws we've got maybe with some other laws, and so it goes. And at any one point, we have laws that we can't explain. That's certainly true. And by the way, your, 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 uh, uh, the sort of caricature of laws as if they were the kind of laws that, you know, there's penalties for violating. That's not what, what scientists have ever meant by laws of nature. And anybody who, who thinks that that's, uh, that's a legitimate criticism has simply misunderstood the nature of, of, a, of the sort of generalization that a, that a physical law is supposed to be. Um, uh, Smolin present some speculations. He says, here's one thing it could be. I cite them as speculations and say, here's an idea. I don't endorse it. I say, here's, a, here's an interesting set of scientific ideas. It's nice because it's actually testable. And there are others. There's actually an embarrassment of riches. There's lots of ideas for what it could possibly be that could explain the fine-tuning, that could uh, possibly explain the fine-tuning of this universe. Um, um, that's all the cosmologists and all the physicists are doing at this point, is, is responding to what otherwise looks very appealing, and that is, what could it possibly be but an intelligent creator? The answer is, oh, there's lots of things it could possibly be but an intelligent creator. So we'll just call that a draw, maybe. Maybe this is where, where your agnosticism can, uh, can join mine, and we say, we really don't know uh, what could or would explain the laws of nature, but we don't need, we don't need to uh, invoke an intelligent creator to explain it. And in fact, the trouble with an intelligent creator is that it seems to 
get um, the, the wrong end of the stick because we need to explain where did that intelligent creator come from? Isn't that even more marvelous than the fact that there uh, might be uh, even an infinity of universes all with slightly different generalizations in them? That idea seems to me at least less extravagant than the idea of a self-creating eternal omnipotent intelligent creator. Um, Let's see. I'll say a bit more about Stalin and atheism then. Um, yes, I think that we all have to recognize that any powerful idea can be misused, can be abused, and can lead to great harm. And I'm sure that some atheists have made the mistake of what we might call Dostoevsky's mistake, and that is if, if God is dead, everything is permitted. Now, that does not follow at all. That is a, that is a uh, myth that has done a tremendous amount of damage in the world. And any atheists who think that an implication of their atheism is that there's no difference between right and wrong, that there's no room for morality, I think it has made a very serious mistake. Uh, it's a mistake which is very easily made because so many religious people insist on this principle as well. They seem to think that without God there can't be any goodness, there can't be any morality. Uh, this is belied, I think, by everything we know. And notice, finally, that if, even if it were true that we needed God to tell us what's right and wrong, God doesn't tell us only God's self-appointed representatives on earth tell us. So in other words, we're going to have to tell each other anyway. Human beings can figure out what is reasonable, what is rational, and what is moral. Human society has evolved to the point where we can sit down and reason, and of our own free will, arrive at the best principles to govern our lives by our own lights after open, free, reasonable discussion, fact-based discussion. That's the basis of morality. It's always been the basis of morality. If you look at the morality in the Old Testament, compare it to the morality today, you'll find that it has changed a great deal. And it has changed because people's ideas about what makes sense, what's right and wrong, have, have evolved. They've grown up. And it's not because God told them something different today than told them before. It's they just figured out that they could no longer tolerate the interpretations of what the, uh, God was supposedly telling them morality was that, that, used to, that used to pass muster. So we're, we're stuck telling each other as best we can how to live our lives and what makes sense morally. And if it helps you to adorn that process with an imagined deity that speaks to you, that's a psychological fact about you, but it plays no role in the discussion. I've been trying to listen um, hard in this debate because I don't want this to be uh, a mudslinging cartoon debate, but one in which we really try to engage issues. And uh, so rather than rebut, I'm going to try to seriously engage some points that have been raised here. I, I agree, by the way, that morality is not in any way the special province of religious people. I completely agree with that. I think morality is a universal phenomenon. But I think it is a universal phenomenon that cannot be given the easy explanation that Dan gives. We evolved. Wait a minute. Does any biologist believe that we have in a serious way evolved over the last 5,000 years? No. Biologically, we have not evolved culturally. Morally, socially, institutionally, we're different. Biologically, we're very much the same as Homo sapiens was 5,000. So the word evolution now has been transmuted from a biological meaning, and it's been put on a moral high horse.